So section 4.9, first thing I want to talk about is the next thing we're going to see in chapter 5 is we're going to see a definition of the definite integral, where actually it's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. It says the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to capital F of b minus capital F of a. So notice here I've got a lowercase f and uppercase f's, and they mean two different things. So we we'll figure out what those mean. We say a function capital F is called an antiderivative of little f on an interval L, provided the derivative of capital F is equal to little f for all x and L. So if I take the derivative of big F, I get little f. And what this is telling me, that if I take the integral of little f, I get back to big F. Okay? Notice here, it has the word an antiderivative. And the reason for that is because we have the following things that we need to talk about. So let's just take the derivative of x squared. Well, that's going to end up being 2x. Well, if I take the derivative of x squared plus 1, well, again, that's just going to be 2x plus 0, which is 2x. So if little f is x squared, big F could have been x squared. I mean, if big F, little f, so this is big F, this is little f. If little f is 2x, big F could have been x squared, or x squared plus 1, or x squared plus pi, or x squared plus any constant. So when we work backwards with these antiderivatives, Okay, we need to remember that there is going to be the possibility of a constant that's tacked on the end. And we're going to figure out how to deal with that constant in um, some of the work in this chapter, find exact values for initial value problems. And we're also going to see that, hey, when I choose the constant that I'm going to use for this formula in Chapter 5 for the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, I can pick the easy constant, which is the plus zero, because... The constant here is going to subtract from the constant there, and the constants are going to the constants are going to go away. So, basically, what we need to do is we need to be able to undo derivatives. So there are 14 derivatives that we use primarily during semester one, and those are the same 14 that we're going to need to know how to undo. I'm going to start on the right-hand side of the board. We had a power rule. We said x to the n. We brought down the exponent, and then we subtracted 1 from the exponent. So what we're going to do is to undo that is we're going to add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent and add c. Okay, that was not too hard to do. The big thing here is on this one here, n cannot be equal to negative 1, because if n was negative, dividing 0. We'll have another one that we can deal with that. The derivative of e to the x was e to the x. So the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x plus c. That's why natural logs and exponential functions are really nice to work with in calculus. The derivative of sine was cosine. So the antiderivative of cosine is sine plus c. The derivative of cosine was negative sine, so the antiderivative of sine is going to be negative cosine plus c. The derivative of tangent is can't square. Antiderivative of secant squared x is tangent x plus c. The derivative of secant is secant times tangent. Therefore, the antiderivative of secant times tangent is secant plus c. The derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. 
Therefore, the antiderivative of cosecant squared is negative cotangent plus c. The derivative of cosecant x is equal to negative cosecant cotangent. Therefore, the antiderivative is cosecant cotangent. A cosecant cotangent is negative cosecant. The derivative of b to the x is b to the x times natural log of b. So I ended up multiplying by the natural log of b. So the antiderivative of b to the x, I'm going to divide by the natural log of b. And again, b cannot has to be more than 0, but not equal to 1 for it to be an exponential function. The derivative of natural log of the absolute value of x is 1 over x. Therefore, the antiderivative of 1 over x dx, which can also be written as dx over x, is the natural log of x plus c. The derivative of the inverse sine of x is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Therefore, the antiderivative of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared is the inverse sine of x plus c. The derivative of an inverse tangent was 1 over x squared plus 1. Therefore, the antiderivative of 1 over x squared plus 1 is the inverse tangent plus c. And the derivative of inverse secant was 1 over x square root of x squared minus 1. Therefore, the antiderivative of 1 over x times the square root of x minus 1 is the inverse secant plus c. And the last one, the derivative of x with respect to x is 1. Therefore, the antiderivative of dx, which can be written as antiderivative of 1 dx, is x plus c. And we have our same rules that we talked about during when we talked about the definite integral. The integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals. And I can pull constants through the integral symbol. And a constant times an in, um, a function that I'm taking the integral of can be the same thing as the constant times the integral of the function. So my recommendation for you is that you copy these 14 things down. Um, they are all listed in section 4.9 in your book. However, they have A's all over the place in your book. My recommendation is right now until I teach you how to deal with those A's is that you write them without the A's and because that's we're basically going to use them without the A's for the next section or two then I'll show you how you can come up with those A's on your own. That way you don't have to remember two different formulas. So again we need the power rule, e to the x, sine of x, cosine of x, tangent, secant, cotangent, cosecant, b to the x, natural log of absolute value of x, inverse sine, inverse tangent, inverse secant, and just x. Those are the 14 that we will be working with.